Well, I'm so very glad to be here. It is um, the remarkable work of Yah that has brought me here. <laughs> we were here a year and a half ago, and we had intended to come back really a year ago. But a certain war started, and that war preempted our journey. And now here we are. We flew in. We flew to Dubai. And now they've canceled the flights, all flights out of Dubai. Wow. So good thing we're flying another direction home. <laughs> but I want to say how blessed we have been in being here. It's been absolutely remarkable. And, uh, you know, and I have to tell you, even though I'm going to introduce myself now, really, this is not about me, but I have to give you enough about me so that you understand my credibility to the extent that I have any. You know, um, it's a funny thing because... I believe I had an argument with Yah in heaven before I was born. And I was being very boastful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can put me anywhere on earth and I'm still going to show you what I could do. So he did. And he put me in Alaska, of all places, which at that time was pretty much the end of the world. It may not be the end of the world, but it's certainly the end of Western civilization. You know, and you can see it from there. Hello. And uh, so I grew up in Alaska and... I grew up in a very difficult environment, i.e. Alaska. I grew up in an Irish home in an Alaska environment. So it was extremely difficult and very abrupt. But it was kind of a funny thing because I had a revelation, if you will, when I was 18. And I said to myself, if there's one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to accept the truth as I find it. And this was my big commitment to myself. And I became a truth seeker at that moment. Now I was a completely lost individual, but nonetheless, I was seeking truth. And I am convinced that if a person seeks truth, they will find the truth if they seek it with all their heart. Seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And so I was seeking the truth and I had many setbacks along the way. A lot of trauma in my life. Um, you know, I went to 18 funerals by the time I was 21 years old of close friends that had died. So it was a very violent uh, milieu uh, that I grew up in. And, but there was a time when I just, you know, I wasn't going to take no for an answer, really. And so I just kept pushing. It was like, you know, if you had a 500-mile walk through the wilderness, when you start out, there's 500 miles ahead of you. But if you put one foot in front of the other, pretty soon it's four ninety nine, right? Yeah. And so this was the situation with me. I was just going to keep pushing. Well, I won't. I won't get into too much detail of it. Well, I should tell you the kind of the critical event that happened in my life. My sister and I were actually uh, rock and rollers. We played rock and roll. We toured the United States, and uh, then I kind of retired from that when I turned twenty years old because. I got mad at the whole industry because it was too predictable, too stereotypical, and uh, I couldn't stand hearing it anymore. <laughs> and the musicians wouldn't practice, and I was a practice nut. So I went and became a pianist at 20 years old and uh, started practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week, which I did for the next eight years. And so I finally got in the amount of practice that I wanted to have. But in the meantime, something had happened. My sister, who was kind of a Janis Joplin type, was playing with these musicians one Saturday night, and the guy who played the Hammond B3 looked at her and said, hey, it's good for you to sit here and play with me tonight, but why don't you come and play with me tomorrow morning? What were you playing tomorrow morning? Well, he was the organist for a black gospel church in Anchorage. And, you know, some of those gospel churches, I don't know if you've ever been to a gospel church in the States. But they really lift it up. <laughs> you know, I mean, they really do. And anyway, so she was in there. And the next thing you know, she has this conversion moment. So my sister comes home and she's just joyous like I've never seen her. And all of a sudden her life has turned, right? And I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty good. And I'm looking at my sister going, that's pretty good. That's a great pathway for us, you know. But three weeks later, she was killed in a head-on collision. Coming back from Girdwood. And... That was my 18th funeral. 
And so when I went to that funeral, I became convinced in my bone marrow that should I ever make such a confession of faith, I'd be dead three weeks later. I mean, it was in my bone marrow, you know. And so I went through this huge trauma that went on for years, years and years and years. And finally, there came a moment where I would be fighting with both the forces of good and evil, you know. There was always Hasatan breathing over my shoulder. Hey, I'm right here. Hey, I got it going on. Hey, you want the world? I'll give it to you. And I'm like, get out. Get out. You know, being an Alaskan. So we're not going to take any advice from anybody, right? <laughs> Including Satan. Hit the road, buddy. I'm doing it my way. You know. <laughs> anyway, um, but that war became very volatile. And I didn't realize at the time that Yah was fighting over my grave. I didn't know that. I thought I could get out from under it. But he was fighting over my grave, you know. And so he pulled me out of this abyss. He pulled me out. But it was slow. I was a slow cook. I was on the, you know, the crock pot, right? And so then the question was, what was I going to do? And so there came a point. I just, I had all my plans laid out and they were all working pretty well. And I had figured out, okay, I'm leaving Alaska. I've got it all worked out. I'm getting out of here. So I had the right job. I had them transfer me. I had them pay for all my stuff to move out to Washington. I had a place to go to. I had a job to land there and everything. Everything was in great shape. Hey, I did it. Four months later, I was moving my furniture back up the same flight of stairs in Anchorage. Mm -hmm. And when I was pulling, the, when I was carrying the couch up the stairs, I said to myself, well, so much for my plans, <laughs> right? Like I'm going like to do it, right? Anything. So I just tossed my hands up and I said, it's all yours. I'm now in your I'm now in your hands. Do with me what you will. However it goes, I'm good to go. And so he did. And he changed my life entirely. And you know, the next thing you know, I'm graduating law school. And uh, which was ridiculous, me going to law school. When I was in law school, they nicknamed me the enemy. <laughs> because of course they wanted to brainwash all the lawyers to think in the same way. And I'm like, not brainwashable. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. So at one point, they wanted to have a day of silence on campus for gay rights. Everybody has to be silent for homosexual rights. So I said, well, you guys ever heard of the First Amendment? You know, so I showed up with my ghetto blaster, you know, rock box, boom box, whatever they call them. I showed up with my boom box, put on Overture to Der Meister Singer, Played that in the quad and said, okay, who wants to debate <laughs> on the day of silence? <laughs> they were, shall we say, very angry with me. And they got more and more angry. In fact, the very last day of school, I was taking an advanced business class. And uh, I had to do an oral presentation. And so I was prepared to do this oral presentation. In fact, well, I, I started it. And I was teaching in this far left-wing communist and hyper-environmentalist woke law school, I was teaching on the morality of profit, which, of course, profit to them is absolutely anathema. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching about one man's trash is another man's gold, right? One man's garbage is another man's gold. And started teaching about the most moral thing you could do is a voluntary transaction for profit. Well, there were five guys in the front that were just going nuts. And so the professor comes up to me and he says, can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure. He said, look, you've already got your grade. You need to get out of here right now before this class ends and get off this campus because those guys are hunting for you. They're going to give you a treat before you leave the law school. So I left and said, dust be done to you. See you later. Goodbye. And uh, I, I remained the enemy to the far left in the Pacific Northwest for a long period of time. But too bad. Sometimes a person has to speak up. Particularly when people are going sideways. And so at any rate, nonetheless, Stephanie and I were on pretty much the same spiritual journey. And our journey just continued through our belief and in our faith. And we walked through, you know, several Protestant denominations. <laughs> You know, going from uh, uh, from really in a Presbyterian church to a non-denominational church, evangelical church. And I ended up doing mission work. I started doing mission work in 2002. 
And this is why I can appreciate you guys who do a mission work in Uganda and other places. Uh, you know, you give up a lot to do mission work, but you know what? There is nothing that is, is better at changing the behavior of, of a believer than doing mission work. You know, you can go to church your whole life and your behavior doesn't change one iota. There's no difference between in the church and out of the church in terms of what you do and how you walk. But when you do mission work, you change. You change because you have to rely on the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. You have to rely on the Ruach HaKodesh. And most of the missionaries that I have seen have been very Ruach motivated. In fact, I would say most missionaries will not go until the Ruach compels them to go, until you've reached that boldness. And you see this in Acts, right? You see this in the end of the, the Gospels and the beginning of Acts, where Mashiach comes to the, the cowards, really, who they were, right? They all ran away from the cross, with some exceptions, mainly the women didn't. But all the, all the rest of the guys did, the exception of one or two. And he says to them, look, you guys aren't ready to go anywhere. Go hunker down. Go back to the upper room and hunker down and cover your head and shiver and wait until the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon you. Then you will be ready to go. And sure enough, on what day? Shavuot. Shavuot. This day, on Shavuot, the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon them and presto, they're ready to give their life for their understanding, for their faith, for their belief. For what they knew was true. You see? And this is what you see with a lot of missionaries being emboldened with the Ruach HaKodesh to step out in faith. You know, to boldly split the infinitive, right? You know, in Star Trek, to boldly go, that splits the infinitive. It's a grammatical error. You know, you can either, you can either boldly go or you can to go boldly, but you can't to boldly go. That splits the infinitive. It's a grammar error. Anyway, never mind. So, with this happening, I started, my first mission was, I initially prayed to do a mission work to Italy. And Yao said, no, 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 you're going to Russia. I said, Russia, didn't I just leave that cold country? <laughs> yeah, you go back to Russia. Okay, all right, David, here you're talking to a militant anti-communist to the bone marrow. And I'm going into this former communist nation. So I didn't know what to expect. And um, we got into Russia and found a country that was really, they had for the first time in maybe 300 years, freedom. But the Russians have a saying, the tallest blade of grass is the first one mowed. So you might have freedom, but they don't forget what you say in public. They don't forget what you did. You know, you're marked, boom. Oh, there's a tall blade of grass. So had communism come back or Stalinism come back, the people who were speaking out on behalf of the faith would have suffered and could have suffered execution. And here we were, boom, we're in there just in everybody's face talking about how great America is. It was really quite rude, actually. The missionary, the American missionaries were condescending and uh, very self-aggrandizing and so on, instead of blessing the missionaries that were there. A blessing to people who had already given their life for their faith, exposed themselves to a program, exclusion. You know, if you were known as a Baptist or a Pentecostal in Russia, which were the two registered unions, you lost your job. You know, you couldn't live in the good neighborhood. Your kids couldn't get, go to the school. Sometimes they'd be beaten up at school because they weren't orthodox. And so these people have, were already sacrificing for their faith. And we're going to come in there and tell them about, you know, what we, what you, you know, what you need to do to become more American. Well, let me tell you, the last thing you want to do is become more American. Don't do that. Do not become more American. Don't do that. Okay. America is a very lost nation. And it's so lost right now that is, it's on its deathbed. Will we survive the year? Maybe. Will we survive this election? Maybe. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen because we have a mental disease in the country and it's killing the country. And really, you know, when you look at all of this and I'll get into this some more of this in a minute, but the long and the short of it was I ended up doing mission work in Russia. And then one of my, my friends, Pastor Yuri Mikhailovich, he said, you know, Stephen, you need to go to Georgia. 
And I said, Georgia, why do I need to go to Georgia? I don't want to go to Georgia. Wait, what do I know about Georgia? Oh, yeah, you look like a Georgian. You speak Russian like a Georgian. You should go to Georgia. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. So sure enough, the Ruach got behind me, was just like pushing me. You need to go to Georgia. Go to Georgia for the. I'm like, hey. <laughs> you know. So, so finally, I went to this friend of mine. I said, "You know, I'm supposed to go to Georgia." He says, "Oh, okay. I'll call Danut." So he calls this fellow named Danut, and Danut says, "Well, talk to uh, Zali Tikashilishvili in Belisi." So I sent him an email. I said, "Okay, I'm supposed to come there and visit you." He said, "Okay, we'll come now. Come later, but come." So on the strength of that email, we went. And we took a team of nine people, and we went into Gruzia. Sacred Velo, they call it, Gruzia. And we get into Belisi, and it was the poorest of the newly independent states of the Soviet Union. The poorest. So we get off the airport. I mean, you know, this is the kind of thing where you get off the airport, there's no ramp leading up to the gate. There's get off the plane and walk down the stairs, you know, cross the tarmac crossed the tarmac into basically a plywood shack that had bare 200 watt bulbs, you know, hanging from the ceiling. Okay. Here's customs. <laughs> okay. And of course, you know, the women that were with us immediately fled to the bathroom, you know, and so we're out there standing around there going, okay, what are we going to do? You know, but as we came and when we, when we went out into Belize, it looked like the place had been bombed. You know, the streets hadn't been paved in 30 years. I mean, it was just a, it was a war zone. And we had elected to live with the believers. So we were living in houses that had no running water, that had no hot water, that had, you know, elevators that didn't work and they lived on the 10th floor, you know, these kinds of things. And so we did, I did mission work there for four years in a row in Georgia, in Gruzia, made many good friends, saw the whole country. And, uh, you know, we saw, I saw uh, the extent of the oppression. But that very first trip, because we had walked blindly in faith behind the impetus of the Ruach, we saw miracle on miracle on miracle. So I'll just tell you one. So before we leave, you know, I had a couple of young people with me who were award winners in jazz music. They had won big awards in the nation, best jazz singers, you know. And so I wrote the ambassador, the American ambassador. I said, hey, We've got some jazz people here. You want to hear some jazz? And this lady writes me back. She says, the ambassador hates jazz. If you want to bring us something, bring us some Tabasco sauce, you know, some hot sauce. Okay. Then she, she says, but if you're interested, I can set up a performance venue for you in downtown Tbilisi. I said, okay, all right. So then she turns it over to her Georgian assistant. Well, the Georgians are, you know, famously, at least in their own minds, legendary talents were the great singers were the great dancers were the great artists you know we we were the ones who brought art to russia on and on and on and on okay so this georgian girl writes me who do you think you are you think you're going to perform at belisi you know so i got mad at her and i sent her my music resume so when i sent her my music resume zali writes me back and he goes oh this changes everything uh -huh, how's it change everything this is friday we're leaving sunday you know oh it does so we showed up there and sure enough, Monday night, they had us booked at the Akvladiani Museum in downtown Tbilisi to play music. Uh, okay, all right. So we go down there, and they had this beautiful seven-foot, um, what was the name of that piano? Very good piano. Anyway, so we come down, and I see this seven-foot piano. I'm, okay, this will work. It wasn't a Beckstein. It was a, I forget what it was called now. But uh, anyway, what they didn't know was we were singing gospel music, praise music, Worship music. They had no idea, right? You don't have to worry. And don't you be afraid. Singing four-part harmony, right? <laughs> so we get up there and we, we put on a two-and-a-half-hour presentation. The people from the museum are there. The people from the conservatory are there. The newspapers are there. And we finish up this presentation. And Zali comes to me and he says, well, Stephen, he says, this is remarkable. I said, what's so remarkable about it? We just sang a few songs. He says, no, no, no. He said, the Pope came here four years ago and the Georgian Orthodox Church kicked him out of the country. He went to the patriarch of the church and said, well, can we at least pray the Our Father together? The guy said, no, get out. We don't want you here. Leave. Mm -hmm. 
Then Billy Graham or Franklin Graham showed up and he wanted to put on a crusade, which was just going to be a film in downtown Belize. Anybody who went to that, there were Orthodox guys at the door beating them up, physically beating them up. I said, yeah. He said, you don't know this, but the, this performance tonight is the first time praise and worship has been performed in public in the history of Georgia, in the history of the country. And we proceeded to do four outdoor performances thereafter. We played in, in um, Tuscan Valley. No, it was, um, I can't remember that. Oh, Kutaisi. We played in a town called Kutaisi. We played in Kutaisi. We were just, we went outside in the front yard to rehearse. So we're sitting out the front yard, we're singing, we're playing, and the sun starts going down and people start gathering. Well, the next thing you know, there were 60 confessions of faith that night. We, we, we weren't even planning on anybody being there. The next day, we went into Kutaisi, and we're standing out, we're out waiting to try to up, upload something on their internet cafe, right? The internet cafe at that time was four terminals hooked up to a 64K modem. <laughs> so, so Mark is in there trying to enter a blog. It's like, M, <laughs> A, you know, <laughs> he, he was pulling his hair out. Well, Jenny Cook was outside and she's talking to this gal upstairs. She says, oh, yeah, we're from America and we sing. And can we come up and sing? She says, oh, yeah, come on up. So we go up and there were seven people in this hair salon. And we were going to sing, um, he knows my name. I have a maker. He formed my heart before even time began. My life was in his hands. Right? It was remarkable. We got that much of the verse done. All seven people in the in the in the salon were in tears. So Jenny Cook, of all people, the 18-year-old, starts preaching. And she starts going on and on and on and on and on and on and on. All these confessions were happening. We had to get out of there before we got in trouble. So this is what we saw with what? The impetus of the Ruach HaKodesh, blessing the missionary who trusts in the Ruach. Trust and believe and <laughs> jump and jump. And when you do, miracles abound. Huh? Miracles abound. So anyway, you know, so anyway, I was still practicing law at the time. And I came back. And of course, all of that changed my life dramatically, just dramatically changed my life. And so I came back and I wanted to teach in Russian. I wanted to teach this passage in Russian, which the Russian passage is this. It's Mashiach talking to Pilate. He says, you not going to do this. Any top of it was for this reason I was born, and this reason I came to the earth. What reason was it? What was his reason for being born and coming to the earth? What does he tell Pilate? To testify to the truth. <laughs> All those who are of the truth hear my voice. And Pilate looks at him and says, hey, What is truth? Mm -hmm. eh, what are you talking about, truth? Right? <laughs> what is truth? <laughs> what is truth? It's a big question, right? What do we know about truth? We know, what I know, is that scripture is the truth. The narrative of scripture is the truth. This is the truth. This is the fundamental truth. This is why if you seek the truth, you will find Mashiach. Mm -hmm. If that's what you're seeking and you don't have any blemish, you don't have any contour, you don't have any, uh, you don't have any mitigating uh, circumstances, you don't have some underlying narrative in your brain telling you, ah. branch in the garden of olives my sweat became blood to remove the wall of separation i am your king the anointed one